All right. Oh my god. What? What, Megan? I'm just laughing that there's a full on argument in the chat already and we haven't even started yet. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's how it goes. We're here to, you know, bring people we're here to bring people the news and the arguments. <laughs> um I just like is, to make oh, to take hot show. takes without actually like providing evidence. That's that's my goal. But go on, introduce the show. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I know oh, you guys had a lot burn, of stuff to say. Burn. Why don't you guys go ahead and, and keep talking, and then I'll introduce the show at your at your leisure. <laughs> no, it's fine. We're done talking about movies. We're done. Okay. We're ready. Um, we're ready for the podcast. We're ready. Um, okay, so this is HF Pod. This is the longest-running fish podcast of all time. I just want to tell all you time. guys that. Um, there's also a lot of other a, a lot of other accolades that we could tell you about, but we don't need to go into it right now. We're going to tackle summer 1997 today. But um, what, what's going on in the fish world? Is there anything happening that we need to talk about? I know that there was some like ticket sales happening. Well, for the first time in the history of the fish world, I got the tickets I wanted and then some without having to go through the on sale. I am I have zero complaints. I put in for best available and I got Dick's floors which is the first wow. time I've ever scored floors. Um, the only stress I have now, which you guys know how I work with fish, it's all stress related. Yeah. I'm going to have to go into a different entrance for each show mm -hmm. because uh, that's just the way that Dick's runs. They don't, they, they haven't figured out a way to have all the floor people and the GA stands people going in the same doors, uh, which means I'm going to have to coordinate, but you know, RJ, you know this. I've got Jeremy Smythe in my life. I've got, um, you know, he is he's one of the most organized and diligent and incredible concert going homies I've ever encountered in my entire life. He'll just have to organize it and take care of it and uh, keep Sam Timberg in line. As long as that's possible, I can get in and be happy each night and potentially go down to the floors and get really close to see Corota wash over my, 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 my zone and my bean like I did in Mexico. Good stuff. Yeah, you gotta get you gotta get the zones, you know. The zones, you gotta, baby. I, I'm there for the gotta zones. Gotta get the zones. I'm gonna get the zones in Grand Rapids too because I also got GAs in the like in the lottery. Who knew? And I'm gonna see my favorite band in my hometown 30 years after I first saw them there, and I am just over the moon about it. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this on sale stuff works, but it seems complicated, and everyone gets really stressed. I feel like people have been really happy this year, though, which okay, is good. interesting. Mm -hmm. It's about time. You know, we're out of the pandemic. It's over. COVID's over. It's time to get back to being happy. I've wondered oh, long why they wouldn't just give their most dedicated fans who put in for the lottery the tickets that they want. It seems like a very simple concept, but, like, we're not going <laughs> to sell out the venue. Like, that's just not, like, there's just, like... Just give us what we want. We'll go to the shows and then let the rest of them get stuck with obstructed views and lawns and whatnot. This. So, okay. That was good. Um, and we got a, um, it looks like we, Spectrum 90. Oh, sorry. 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 We can go back to that. Spectrum 97 is released in two days. Yeah. I can't wait. Can't wait. According to our correspondent, which is awesome. That's going to be great. Um, is it going to go is, straight to live fish or is there going to be a delay again? Like the gorge? I believe it's going to live fish. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there's going to be some in-depth ticketing explanations today about stuff. I don't know. I hope it, I hope it, I hope it's like, you know, recorded for posterity. Um, okay. Thank so you. we have, we have a lot to discuss today because we're 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 kind of breaking with the fans here and i hope it's you know i hope i hope the fans who voted all like 500 of you don't hold it against us because really we had said from the beginning that we we're gonna take those votes into consideration that's really all we promised mm -hmm. and we did that we did that we did yeah but but we yeah. have quite a we have quite a delta here between the fan vote and and our vote so you know, I guess there's not really any way to 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 say it, but that. But I want to ask you guys: How are you guys approaching these episodes? Because, and I, and I want to know from listeners how you're. If you're listening along, how are you doing it? I'll tell you guys that I. So I'm going with each tour chronologically. I start with the first show, 
listening to as many full shows as I can, but also like highlights of some shows. So like for this for this tour, this was pretty easy because there's not as many. I mean, not easy, but easier. But I, I have to start from the beginning. I don't jump around at all or start with jams. I have to start with like a full show, the first show of the tour. And then I kind of like mix it up between full shows and highlights throughout the tour. What, how, how are you guys doing it? Pretty similar. I start at the beginning to always go chronologically. And I usually look at the jam charts. And then I also look, read reviews of shows and kind of see where I can't, what I can't miss. And then I'll look at like timings on re-listen or, you know, live fish and see kind of like, I don't, I definitely want to hear this, you know, theme that's 15 minutes as opposed to like one that's seven, you know? So it's kind of a game like that. And I try to make a list of all the jams that I know I can't miss and make sure I take like longer notes on those. But it's, it always comes down to the wire for me. I'm always listening, like the walk home from work right before we record and that morning. And, um, but it's really fun to do. Yeah. Similar to you guys. I mean, I have, um, one of the things that's great about our ongoing partnership and friendship is that we, the three of us love Apple notes. And so I have a note that I copy the questions that we laid out in our initial doc and I update that and I list where does the, where did the fans rank this? Where did we rank this? <clears throat> and I kind of build that out over the course of a week. I listen to the tour starting with the first show. I don't start with listening to the full show. That is a really interesting approach. So every tour that we do, you are listening to show number one and then scattered highlights and maybe another show at some point. Yeah. Is that correct, RJ? That's, yep. that's, oh, that's interesting. I don't do that either. Um, the, the, I gotta the hear first... I gotta hear how the tour started or else I don't like That's an interesting way to know. do it. Um yeah. I I will go through both the fish.net jam chart as well as kind of highlights I recall that I've listened to. But I'll also, to your point, Meg, if you're going through re-listen and you see such and such song looks like it's jammed out, what's going on here? And sometimes it's not documented because there's so many debuts that are documented that not all the type two jams of different songs are documented. Um, so I'll listen to that and I'll go back to like highlights that I loved. What I will also do is I'll start to fill out the questions as we're going through this. Like, why is this tour ranked where it is? A jam hits me in a certain way and I'll be like, okay, this is where I think that this is where it's at. What is the big theme? Mm -hmm. Oh, this, this jam sounds like this jam. So I'm going to go back and listen to this. But what I start to do is make a list of what are the can't miss shows and what are the shows I think should be released via live fish and whatever those are. I listen to those in full because I want to make sure that the information I'm giving to the people is accurate. I can't just project a show date <laughs> and be like, this should be released and then not listen to it and not realize that that's why it's not released. Yeah. I do um, the same too. I have, yeah. do you, do you all want to guess how many pages of notes I have for this episode? 17. I can't even guess. Brian, it's fucking guess. 17. I'm Are not you even serious? kidding. You. <laughs> yes. It's 17. I have 17 pages of notes. So I also take notes the whole time and <laughs> spend many a nights listening and and coming down. I just that showed my teacher that I teach with today because he was like, So what's your prep like for the podcast? And I showed him because I was forcing him to listen to the stash from Paradiso. But anyway, and I was I was taking these, showed him these notes, and I was like, I have 17 pages of notes. I can't believe you called it, Brian. Oh, you know me so well. It's just getting That's crazy. Now. <laughs> that is crazy. Um, and I, I didn't know what Neil's question about what, like, what if it's not good, the first one? Like, what if the first show's bad? Then yeah, which is move it, on to the next one? Yeah, it almost always is. You know, I mean, I like it's 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 rare that it's not. So once if you're mentally prepared, it's fine. It is interesting listening through these full tours because you do start to hear the pattern. You know, we're now what four or five tours into this. Um, you start to hear the pattern of they rarely start a tour extremely hot, and the idea yeah. that yeah. like like this type of exercise kind of um, crushes the idea that like everything every show is a gift like they are working <laughs> ideas out from the start yeah. and then they reach 
like peak of what they can do with the sound that they're playing with and the tools that they're playing with around midway through the tour. And then usually there's a little bit of a dip and then it peaks again towards the end. Like that is just the nature of the approach that they take to music. So I think that you're absolutely, I think it's an interesting approach that you're taking to listen to the first show because that does tend to set the foundation. Like this first show, I wouldn't argue it's a great show, but it definitely sets the foundation in time of you're going to hear a lot of new songs that you've never heard before and are very, very different from past fish songs. And you're going to hear a lot of old songs played in a very new style that you may or may not like, but sorry, it's the new style we're going to play with for the next seven years of our career. Yeah. And great chalk dust on night one. I listened Sick to that whole show, dust. actually. I'm looking at, I actually listened to that whole show. I, so many of these shows I would put yeah. on and I'd be like, I'm only going to listen to highlights. And then I would just keep it going. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm loving this. I don't want to stop, but you know, 97 is my stuff. So it's probably well, not surprising. Okay, let's talk about then, Megan, because you love this so much, why did you rank it so much lower than the fans? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if this was my draft pick. I, I know, think the it whole probably time was. I was, probably wasn't. I was really, I feel like I'm having memories of our draft and remembering that I was very anxious that this wasn't going to make the list and that it was too low. I mean, there's no doubt this is just such an incredibly important tour. You know, they're workshopping this new sound. This approach to jamming and incorporating it more consistently was crucial to where the band was at this time. And I did want it higher because of the accomplishment that this represents, you know, for a band to like reach the peak of 95 and then to have to decide what to do next creatively. They learned they could like play as fast as they could, get as weird as they could. Like, what do you do next? And the fact that they found Groove as a way to explore and as a place to launch jams through and on top of, you know, then layer and add textures and sounds, you know, they're giving us that funk. And as Reba's saying right now, like, you got to have that funk. But there's definitely an argument that this sound came into like, sorry, Reba's just killing me right now. There's definitely an argument that this sound came into its full potential, like when they brought it stateside. And it's very debatable if that like was super successful in the summer or the fall. But I think that there's definitely some shows and some sets in this tour that are not like revolutionary or must listen to fish. There's a lot of repetition, but both of the parts that are so revolutionary and incredible are just some of the best fish I've ever heard in my favorite stuff the band has ever made. And I feel like this tour is almost like a sound check for summer and fall 97. couple thoughts. Ryan's right on track here. You know how like people, when they have a newborn baby, they have like a sign, like don't ring the doorbell. Baby is napping. You need like a sign, like two houses down. That's like cross the street podcast recording. Um, I'm sorry, everybody. I think you're spot on. I think like, I think here, here's where we get into the complexities of ranking and, and why I think it is not for everyone and why it is it is ultimately challenging, but why I love the exercise. I think it's been a lot of fun here. This tour has some of the best moments in fish history and some of yeah. the most like inspired, transgressive, like breaking all barriers. It, it, this, this tour has some moments that like is everything I crave. Like there is one jam segment that we're going to talk about that – I listened to, and I sent to like 15 other people. I was like, holy shit, when was the last time you listened to this? This is some of the most amazing music I've ever heard in my entire life, regardless of band. Oh my God. But I think your point about it being kind of a sound check, like this is the band fully realizing, like they, they discovered this sound in the winter, but a lot of those winter shows are pretty straight. You know, there's moments, yeah, but like are. it's pretty straight. This is like this is a tour where they are fully embracing it and saying, let's see if this sound can take over our entire shows and take over an entire tour. But at the same time, they haven't fully like accepted that this is the sound that's going to take over. So it's like mm -hmm. they're truly in a laboratory trying to figure out, does this work? It's like such experimentation. And it's the type of thing that couldn't happen a month later in front of 20,000 fans at various amphitheaters. And so you're left with like some shows don't totally come together because the new approach is really hard and it's really challenging. So you get a lot of really scattered highlights. Um, 
The new songs are very shocking in a lot of ways. They draw this line in the sand, but it ultimately feels to me like, um, like a, I don't know how to say this without taking a bunch of grief, so I'm just going to say it. It reminds me of Fall 96, like especially November in the way that it feels like a transitional tour in the way that it leads to much better music later on. But they needed this tour, like absolutely needed this tour to get where they're going. Like without this tour, I don't think you get as great of a summer tour or as great of a fall tour. Um, And I don't think that this could have happened in front of as many fans as we were going to get, you know, six weeks later. What are your thoughts, RJ? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, I do think as we're in these, you know, this is number 21, right? I think when we're in the 25 to 15 range, we're going to get more tours that are more symbolic than they are necessarily Mm. like full, you know, fully like front. I think the top 15 will be like, it's going to be hard to see where there's like any lulls at all in music I, I, to me, like, you know, I think the ranking here, uh, the fans, which was ranked number eight, we ranked it 21. Um, I it's, think it's pretty heavily influenced by this amazing release toward the end of the tour. And yeah. we're talking, and we're Weird. talking about 13 full shows. There's six one set festival shows where basically nothing mm-hmm. really happens. So we're talking about yeah. a group of 13 shows and they're within those shows, maybe like eight, are like really amazing. Yeah. So like, yeah, I you know, it. but they're, they're great. Like some, those great shows are amazing. And I think it deserves to be, you know, in the, in this series for sure. I just think it's interesting that I wonder if we had done this before the Amsterdam 97 release, if, if yeah. that would be, if, if it would be ranked in the same way. Well, that release too, I think it's done so well. And I think anything that's put on live fish from 1.0 really lends to a bias. And I think people, including me, love 1997. And, you know, for good reason. It's it's thrilling fish. And there are moments on this tour, like the stash we talked about, or cities from Paradiso, the second set in Leo, Lizard's Jam, like all this stuff that are just jaw-dropping and so risky. And the jamming is so sublime and it has such a vibe to it. And I think that people tend to overrate the whole tour because of those moments are just so high. And and Ryan makes a good point that like this is the it probably is the best sounding fish release. It's it was also so it sounds really good. It was released yeah. in the summer of 2015 when when all things were just like awesome, you know. Um, it, was, <laughs> yeah. it was just a good time, you know. Like I don't know, Hillary Clinton was going to be president, and we were getting we were going to Magna Ball, and we were going oh, to these amazing yeah. fish shows. It was a great it was a great time. You know, it was an so. awesome time, RJ. It was a great time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I guess one we already talked about this is really like you know, kind of 19 shows in a what, three week period. Meg, what else? What else do we need to know about the about the tour itself? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit, but you know, this tour is preceded by a European tour in February and early March. They're going to record Slip Stitch and Pass in March at the Mark Tall. And then they're going to go back to the US and record the first session of what will become the story of the ghost and the Sicket Disc. They have like Brad Stock before they go to Europe again. And then they return to Europe in June and July. And like you mentioned, RJ, this tour is 19 shows, but only 13 of them are headline shows. And the other six are festival or one set shows. And As far as the music goes, this tour has 22 debuts, pretty phenomenal. 14 of those are original, and 13 of those songs are going to debut over the course of the first two nights in Dublin. And six of those songs will end up on Story of the Coast, and three will end up on Farmhouse. And for these 19 shows, there's 61 entries on the jam chart. Wow. I would say it's warranted to have that many. Like yeah. the jams yeah. are the highlight of this of this tour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do and think I there's think a the, point. The flow too. I think that's the, the one thing yeah. that the funk really brings the flow in a major way. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. I think there there's a point in this tour. I think where you can hear like the the what would be known as cow funk like being created. It's not at the very mm-hmm. beginning. It kind of happens toward the end of the tour, but because I think actually just just in terms of a theme, I don't know if you guys agree with this, but I think at some point in the tour, there's a little bit of um, 
like less interesting funk going on, like particularly toward the beginning of the toward the beginning of the tour. There's like like the six six nineteen show, which is which is a fun show to listen to, and there's a bunch of highlights. But I feel like they're just getting into the like let's do like a James Brown thing without kind of mm. adding their own I don't know their own like I don't know palette to it or something. Which, which I think changes later on. That That's the way that I'm hearing it. Well, I wrote down something under the theme category of <clears throat> this is who we are here, but is this who we are back home? Like it, mm. it feels like a kid studying abroad in the sense of like <laughs> you go to, you know, a, a European country. Um, and, and I'm describing myself right now because I, I went through the, <laughs> the very, very like stereotypical study abroad experience where like, being in being overseas, I was like, wow, this is like a whole cultured world. This is amazing. Like everybody smokes unfiltered cigarettes here and just talks about art and literature. Fuck. I'm totally in. Um, Did you get high in Amsterdam at all? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, whole, a lot. A thing. I, I was mainly in Holland it. and I was like, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not going to go to that stereotype. And then night one, I was walking around the canals just getting stoned with my buddies. Uh, it was great. Um, but like, you know, at some point the trip ends and at some point you go back home and everybody back home wants you back and you have had this new experience and you've traveled and you've seen the world in a lot of ways. And I think you kind of get this with the band at this point in time, like they're in their early thirties. They have now been to Europe multiple times. This is their second European tour this year. They've discovered this new sound that they're going to release on record because they realized it was like a game changing point point in their career. And then they play this tour. And I think to your point, RJ, there's this moment midway through June where it's like, well, is this just kind of a gimmick or like, can we actually build off of this? Mm -hmm. And then they will ultimately build off of it in a really cool way. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, the cool thing about this tour is that it's super vibey. Like they are not afraid to settle in some really deep contemplative spaces and quiet and languid. It's such a nice balance to the funk that they were crafting at the time, but it's not just like an exploration of funk like this. It's an exploration of where the funk can take them. It's not only like they found this thing and they're like, we found funk and now that's what we do. It was a new direction for them and it became like a launching pad and a place for them to rest in between musical ideas. And you hear them playing with sounds and ideas on this tour that's going to be the meat of their jams for like three to four years. You know, it's it's the funk that's like carrying them to the promised land of like what their jams will be. And that's what was so exciting about going back to this is I kind of forgot about that. I just thought like, oh, the birth of cow funk is, is summer Europe 97, but it's it's not. It's so much more. It's the birth of like what comes next and where does funk take us to and where can funk be like an avenue that we can walk down to find that next weird place we want to go. I had that exact thought um, because I wrote down just jumping ahead really quickly in terms of defining sounds. One of my notes was this is angular and art house. It's the closest thing we have to campy horror fish. But then my next note was by the end of the tour, the band has already seen what's past funk and it's melodic ambient jamming. Totally. And you kind of hear it mm-hmm. in like the stash. You hear it in the Nuremberg ghost. Like this is a band that is utilizing funk by this point as a means of communication and connection as they figure out where to go next. And these are, they're now moving into styles and sounds that I don't even think that they were thinking of when they played remain in light. Um, totally. Can I, can I give one more theme? Yeah, um, of course. To piggyback on Meg's baseball analogy last week, which was great, by the way. <laughs> Thank she you. She told That's us really that Spring 94 Fish was the final season in the minor leagues. They're about to get to the majors. So I was like, okay, Meg is really into fashion. Uh, we had a big Oscars chat on Sunday night and Meg told me everything about what everybody was wearing. I had no idea, but like it added a ton of depth to the overall show for me. Um, so I was thinking about like, what is this tour from a fashion, uh, uh, you know, from a fashion aspect. And my thought is that this is pop art and optical art fashion fish, you know, like in the late sixties when people were wearing like, you know, cones on them and like, 
big <laughs> pyramid dresses and like, you know, it's, yes. this is like, how do we incorporate, uh, you know, the weird art that's happening in the world and how do we wear that? And how does that define who we are? Like that is, that is to me what you hear when you get uh, this, this level of fish. Loving this metaphor. It's like an Andy Warhol, like twiggy moment. I'm super into this and I totally agree. It's like that tapping into the abstract and, and this idea of like, when does art become fashion and when does music become art? And there's so many moments like that in this jam and excellent fashion metaphor, Brian. I'm so proud of you. And you know what Balenciaga is now. So, you know, you're learning. There's so, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. You. So great. So great. Um, I think that I just want to talk about like real quick, just talk about tape collecting in this era because this was like the idea was like fish went to Europe to like get away from the stress of touring and all the consistent like travel and all the weird fans and you know, all that and like explore and evolve. And um, I feel like that was like, that was the big, that was like the, that's what made the collecting the tapes so fun. And I, I wonder, do you think that's all, do you think that like theory holds up 27 years later that, that that's like what these Europe trips did for them? It kind of gave them a break from like the regular music playing, you know, day to day, not that it's day to day, but you know, the routines of, of kind of touring in the U S I mean, I think like in 96, it was to blow off steam, the summer, summer Europe tour. I think this tour was like intentionally going, like Brian was saying, to do things that they couldn't do in front of 20,000 people. And you see them kind of wrestling with that when they come back to the States. And I'm excited to talk about that tour, um, hint, hint. But it's it's something they could never they could never put on the cones and like wear a weird outfit in the States at this point. I mean, they probably could, but like it was riskier. You know, this is a band that just first started playing big amphitheaters consistently, like, you know, a year and a half before. So it's definitely maybe two years. It's definitely a, they wanted to find a new sound and workshop it in a way. I mean, they went to Europe twice this year. It was really intentional, I think, um, for them to get away and, and try to rebuild in a place that was with low stakes. I think they also knew that they had hit, they'd reached the end of one road. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, we're going to explore some 2.0 and 3.0 tours in the future. Just warning you all, not everything is going to be from the 90s because really, really good music has been made over the last 27 years now since this tour happened. Um, and it should be noted. And I think like one of the things that is fascinating to me about this tour and this era is you know we we always talk about how like they kind of reached this peak on December 31st 95 and then you know in fall in summer and fall 96 they've talked openly about like wanting something else and searching for something else and not necessarily finding it immediately and i think that they knew that if they didn't really change things up um they were going to just plateau and the fun bigness of fish was going to continue, but like the challenge and the excitement and the newness of their sound was never going to come back. And they had to kind of like really grab that, uh, you know, that moment and that opportunity. So I think your point of like getting away from it all, it served two purposes. It both like mm. chills things out they don't have to like, you know, the people who are over there are, are, are investing money and time to come over to Europe, but like they're playing largely in front of smaller crowds and they're playing, you know, in front of people who are in some cases unfamiliar with the band. So there's less pressure for them to be the big fish from, you know, MSG and from the arena shows that they've been playing. Um, but then there's also within that an opportunity to kind of like dig into yourself and figure out what is next. What, what risk do we want to take? So I think it's, it's two things at once. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but like, that's kind of how I, I interpret it based off of like, why did they do this? I think they knew if they didn't, that they may not be around today doing what they're doing. I mean, I, I think that, 
the other piece of that is there it's all the new material which which right. we you yeah. know mentioned and Megan touched on that. I mean, just that that June thirteenth show, there were ten debuts, you know, songs that would become part of the rotation. And I mean, it's a pretty it's a lot of songs to bring out in one show. And so really many. Just, just you know, we're gonna play ten new songs in one show and um also, like Mike's vocals on Velvet Sea were so much more prominent in those early versions than like what we're used to. And I think Paige's voice was like slightly lower. So it kind of sounded like Mike was like singing the verses. And then I like, I realized that his harmony was just really, it was like much louder than it, than it would be today. Um, and a, a lot of those songs like really changed a lot, obviously. Also, can you imagine yeah. being a fan and flying to Dublin? And like still having some jet lag and the sun's out until 11 o'clock at night because we're right ahead of solstice and it's cooler, chillier, like it rains a little bit more than what you're used to coming from the East Coast. And you walk into a fish show and you're like, oh, cool, something familiar and fun. Like I'm seeing fish in Dublin and they play like 16 new songs. You're like, what the, f like, who is this? Like what just yeah. happened? It's just, it's yeah. oh my God. Way. And it was so exciting as you heard like murmurs of that. Like I didn't get the tapes before I saw them 10 days after this tour end, but I remember everybody talking about what had happened in Europe and it was just so thrilling. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about summer 97, but it was just such an exciting thing that they were doing this. It was just really exciting and hearing all these songs, they do, they play a lot of them on this tour. So listening to this whole tour, you do hear these songs a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's do. really yeah. cool to hear them kind of change and grow and especially compared to where they are now. But yeah, I mean, Ghost was just smoking from the beginning. It's so exciting. Like that song, God, such a good song like, right away. Yeah. So good. Yeah. So good. Yeah, man, that was, it's, it's really great. Like, and that's a, that's a great debut and that the, what well, yeah. we can talk about specific shows later, but, um, well, thank you everybody for tuning in and watching live. Welcome the five thirty crowd, the people who just clocked out, we're sitting sitting back to <laughs> check out a little HF pod to kick off the evening. Um, let's talk about the defining sound. And it, and if, if you guys are okay with it, I think for the defining sound, I want to start with an, an outside, a voicemail from an outside expert on on the Ooh, sound. Oh, yeah. Okay with Ooh, you guys? I want to hear from an outside yes, expert. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Hey, guys. Uh, Ryan here. Really excited that you're tackling uh, this uh, amazing early summer 1997 European tour. And one of the things that I love about the tour so much is this is the first time that Paige adds the Yamaha CS60 synthesizer uh, into his rig. What, what synthesizer is that going to add? Uh, you hear that on a ton of the jams from this tour and throughout the rest of 1997, um, you know, becomes like a mainstay in what's the use. The use is on meat stick, but that uh, won't be for a little while. But the main thing here is previously all of the synthesizers that Paige had used before 1997 and even in the February 1997 tour were all uh, monophonic, which means you can only play one note at a time. CS60 is polyphonic, which means he now has access to chords, which really influences um, what he does. You know, you hear it in the, the Amsterdam Reba, even uh, he adds some chords in there. So it's really cool to hear how this influences the band's sound, you know, as they, as they go towards this more groove oriented uh, jamming style. But I'm curious, uh, you know, if, if you guys have any thoughts um, on this synthesizer's impact uh, on the tour. Uh, thanks, as always, for doing what you do. Love you all. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. That was very educational and insightful. I love that. It really was. The keyboard whiz. It's amazing. It's amazing what he brings to the table. Um, what do you guys think? I, I mean, I think like in general, I guess the, the, the one thing about some of these tours we've talked about so far is that you do hear the change in effects, you know, for, mm -hmm. you know, with all of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, the, the first jam that jumps out for me is the gin into cities from Amsterdam, uh, night one. Um, there's like, there's like a part of the jam where it gets into what will later be kind of stop start jamming by the fall, you know, but um, they haven't really like ironed down like 
let's stop on a dime together and like added that effect to it. And so instead, like you get these really percussive beats from Fishman. Mike is just like booming, but like he's not playing a lot of notes, but every note has like, it just, you feel it. Trey's just playing chords. And then you hear this just like, wah, 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 <laughs> from Paige. And like, it is a completely foreign sound to fish. Like you've never heard this before, but then you hear it in that moment and you suddenly think of how this connects to what's the use or how this connects to kind of late night jamming at big Cypress or how this connects to uh, a lot of the jamming at the Baker's dozen and the stuff that Paige has done in the last five, six years. Like it's truly a turning point where they're adding a new piece of technology. And whereas like, the second drum kit you add a new piece of musical equipment two years earlier it doesn't really help the jams this like adds a layer of depth and elevation to the jams that will help them going forward what, what, what are your guys thoughts yeah i think the textures and layers are so crucial and important to the the success and the interest of these jams i mean because they're not just playing funk grooves, but they're also layering it with tons of weird noises and effects, it sounds more fishy than it does, you know, when you just have like a, just to settle into like a wolf man's playing funk or something. It's once they bring in all those sounds, it just adds such a, such a depth to it and so much more interesting. And I think that they're going wild with effects in a lot of these jams and it is cool. It's really fun to listen to. Yeah, but it's and it's also like more restrained than like the '95 kind of out there jams, you know. It's yeah, because like, it's tied to like focused. on top of the funk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's it's an important distinction, and it's I I think it's great you just brought that up because I, I was thinking about it. Um, we talked after the Mexico episode how uh, or actually after the Mexico run that those jams reminded us of 94, 95 in the sense that it's like a lot of segments. These aren't necessarily a lot of segments like this. This feels more like it's on a forward trajectory journey. Like it's not like they're just like a, I almost think of like 95, 94, 95 jams is like they're just like throwing out an idea and they're going in that direction and then they may go in a completely different direction five minutes later, but like, they're just seeing kind of where their muse goes. This is like, let's add some like directional jamming to it. Um, but it also, because of the funk is your point, Megan, there's a listenability to these jams that I think some people would argue and will argue when we talk about fall 94 and summer 95, hint, hint, there is not as much of a listenability to those jams it's more purposeful. This is like both purposeful, but also like you go back and listen to it. Holy shit. You're just like, you're in a melodic groove session. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's one of my notes about like kind of the defining sound of this tour is just the funk really brings flow to jams. It really gives this like, like you were saying, Brian, a forward move. It, it feels like it's, it's, it has like an energetic like almost like ride to it and that you don't get in some of the like weirder jams from like 94 or 95. It just, it has, um, yeah, it has a flow to it that I think is cool. And when you hear that in some of these full sets that become just absolutely perfect examples of set flow where the whole entire set is just tied together, it feels like one big musical idea, even when it goes many different places. And I think that's from the thread of the funk. And I think that balance of like funk grooves and then this really like contemplative dissonance space that they would find themselves in. Like so many of the jams just melt away. I love that in this tour, they're just willing to let things just completely like bleed out. And I think that is just so interesting and a nice, a nice balance to the kind of like forward moving of the funk grooves. And it's, it feels very risky, but also settled in a way. I also think, you know, if, if, if you've listened to this show before, you remember that we started this series with fall 96, right? So this is like, this is really yeah. the next, I mean, there's the, there's the winter Europe tour, but, but you know, we won't, we don't know. We don't know if that'll end up on the list because we, we're, we don't, we're not given any spoilers, but um, <laughs> it, it seems like this is the first like great, this is the first like great improv since the end of 95, really. I mean, there are moments of Fall 96 that are great, 
but this is like it's a different thing and it's i mean there there's reason to be like really really excited about this um which i think is fun you know yeah i'm just <clears throat> i'm looking back so at my notes from fall 96 and you know a couple of things just sh- connect that to this um you hear the band working through changes in the moment arenas plus funk plus songwriting shifts uh they're embracing funk and grooves and textures and truly democratic jamming um the defining sound of this tour is trey on the second drum kit with sirens blaring mike and fish going wild in a jazz funk manner page locked in with melodic chords a lot of that stuff like sounds now when you think about this tour like the building blocks to this, you know, mm, um, yeah. they took a big risk on that tour. They are still rooted in what made fish work from 1992 through 1995. This to your earlier point, RJ is only possible when they step away from the limelight and they are in small clubs traveling across, you know, Europe, not posting shows that night to be listened to by all their fans and analyzed online. Um, I'm curious, like from your perspective, RJ, you saw fish for the first time in fall 95 and you saw this very pure, amazing arena version of fish. Um, I'm guessing you saw them a bunch throughout 1996, but like when you started hearing these sounds from fish as a fish fan who kind of jumped on at a very monumental point in their history, did you reject these sounds? Did you like them? What what do you remember what your thoughts were when you first were hearing these shows and jams kind of emerge? Yeah, I mean, I think the the winter stuff that I got was just like it just felt like a whole different band, like in a in a great way. It felt very refreshing and just totally new, you know. I think the I remember getting like the 217 show and hearing Soul Shakedown Party and just like you know, Karini debut with the Down with Disease, like just hearing new songs and new sounds and new energy. It, it was really, I mean, amazing. So I was, I was definitely like fully, fully excited about this when, when it started. And I actually think, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this eventually. I think the summer 97 tour was, that was the first time I went on summer tour and I thought there were like some amazing moments, but I also thought that like the, some of these shows were, more exciting listening to than some of the shows I saw in person. But, you know, that's, that's probably going to be a bad opinion according to most people, but I thought this was like a really, really great. And then they can, you know, continued it with this tour. I think that everything sounded brand new, but in a really, really awesome way. I think you also get like, I said this earlier, but like this, these shows sound like the band is literally in a laboratory tinkering with who and what makes fish fish. And what do we cast aside? Like there's a lot of songs that are not played throughout much of 97. Tweezer is not played once on this tour. Tweezer has not been played since February and it will not be played again until the gorge. And they are jamming this heavily. They're just figuring out ways that we can pull out what made fish work and see what remains and see what is new. And that is, that is something to an extent that is missing from the summer U S tour where it does feel like still experimental, but almost like a victory lap for the band where like they get back and they open up with that ghost and that ghost freaking rips and that Virginia beach show is really sick. And then the next night they play like a five song Mike's groove and it's amazing. And then the next night they play that killer ghost in Lakewood and it just goes from there. And like the fans are eating it up and the band is like, oh shit, this new sound we found out, it is working. Four weeks earlier, you can still kind of hear them, like they fall back on the fun and the goofiness. Like there's a lot of like contagious fun throughout this tour that feels like the only like historically pure thing about fish on this tour. The rest of it is them taking the music very seriously and just being willing to go wherever their muse takes them. Yeah, and I'm excited to get into that when we talk about Summer 97, but the swagger that they opened that tour with and the the energy that they brought, this new sound to these huge venues in the summer was wild. And being there, I saw those first three shows. It was, it was epic. The fans, we were so happy. I mean, we were just like, yes, give it to us. Like, I heard Ghost like two of those nights and I was like thrilled. You know, it just- Two very good versions. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I yeah. couldn't even believe how good it sounded. Like I I was just, you know, a lot of us were into like rave music then. It was just you know, and we're jumping ahead episodes, but it was a really <laughs> exciting time. <laughs> You're on Let's, episodes um, that we haven't even taken notes on. My God. Yeah. My we, God. Um, <laughs> For our for our wonderful sponsors, we'll take a very quick break. If you're listening, you'll hear a, a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk about our favorite or favorite jams and favorite shows. Ryan, we know I know this is what I'm saying. This is hard. It's harder than it looks. This is the episode on Europe. We're not talking about other tours. Right. Context you know? matters, baby. It's true. We're talking it's about the future. Thing. We're talking about what will happen in the future to contextualize this. <laughs> Context matters. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about the top jams. First, before we talk about the first jams, can we all just talk about the clapping? Because the clapping, especially like the they 614 it Bowie. It's like they love it. When I was there in 96, RJ, they clapped all the time. Europeans love to clap. And then if the Europeans are doing it, when you're an American, you're like, I'm going to clap too. Like, I don't want to seem like a jerk. I don't want to seem like a, like a, you know, like a jaded American. I'm just going to be like, yes, viva la fish. Like, let's go. Let's clap. But but if you clap at the beginning with the like fishmen doing the symbols <laughs> on Bowie, you're in for like a rude awakening because then they start <laughs> the song and, has, you know, like the clapping just doesn't really work. But I guess like maybe it works in that moment. You know, maybe it's not connected to the song. Maybe it's just a clapping thing. It's pretty fun you know? in the moment, but it was, I remember being like distracted by it, like being like, okay, we actually don't clap during Reba or like, I, like we don't actually do this. Like we're quiet. I think it's pretty offensive and I think it calls into question, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm very anti woo. Uh, I just, that's my position on it. Uh, I, I respect that the woo has had a very big impact. It did. I don't think it had a big impact beyond the one time it had a big impact and yet we kept <laughs> wooing, but like the clapping, my goodness, that is, uh, that is, that is not my thing. This is not audience participation. We are watching the masters. Okay. Be quiet. <laughs> um, okay. I guess, uh, that's a good, that's a good point. We haven't talked about, I mean, we have, we've talked about Amsterdam. I didn't even bring any Amsterdam highlights to this because <laughs> I'm sure that we'll talk about it. It's, it's just, just like, yeah. it's just like why, you know, I think in the, I know. Um, right. But, but we, you guys, you should, I'm just going to quickly say, cause maybe we're going slightly chronologically. I think the 20th um, is the first time that I start hearing like much more improvisational approach. Like the first set kind of starts with this oh, jam after taste. Yeah. Um, but the Bowie ghost combo to open set two, like is, is such a, it's a great combo. It's like the second time in the tour when mm -hmm. ghost follows another like big, you know, jam and the ghost gets like really dirty right away. And it's probably the, it's like the first really fun, like really energetic jam that I heard of the tour up to that point, just really like shredding, but also like the layered, aspect of it so i really like that ghost and with the bowie right before it is a really that's a that's a fun time you can hear the song like in its infancy you know but that it really like starts to get the tour going i think yeah yeah i definitely am with you on the like you know there's fun moments like 614 as a 10 minute cavern that goes into a funk groove that is kind of this uh oh wow like funk can be applied anywhere and but yeah it's um like 621's twist 624 Wolfman's like these are really uh kind of boundary pushing jams for each of these songs twist being a relatively new song i mean for me the first truly monumental moment and it kicks off basically a week of like are you guys kidding me you're playing at this level <laughs> fish is the um 625 down with disease into piper into disease into meat stick when I'm praising yeah. Meatstick, we're in really good territory here, guys. Uh, into Magrup, which is like this funky, slow Magrup. I have no idea. Magrup is a complicated song, and somehow they're playing it for the first time in like eight months, <clears throat> and they play it perfectly, but a different approach to it. Like, these guys are insane. Um, that jam... I'd, I'd heard it years ago. I don't know why I had never really gone back to it regularly. 
Like that is going to be my new jam segment that I just listen to on repeat when I want a very specific style of fish. Um, and I'll probably listen to it enough that I get sick of it. And I'm okay with that because like it is amazing fish to discover after 20 years of listening to this band and being like, I think I've heard it all. No, like you haven't. Uh, there's, there's more stuff to be mined. So that segment, it's about an hour. Um, it's some of the best fish I've heard of late and it is where this new approach meets the flow that you're talking about, Meg. It meets really good set listing and it kind of elevates all of this. Like that segment of music is not possible one year earlier. It's just not. Um, and now they are playing random songs strung together in a way that works thematically while the jamming is like, literally pushing down barriers of what the band could have done 10 days earlier. It's, it's stunning stuff to listen to. That yeah, I totally just, blew me away. Go ahead, RJ. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that same thing. I mean, I think that's a really like the first kind of multi-part big jam that we, that we hear that it starts to sound more like what you're used to in like summer, fall 97, like driving jams, but funk. And like, like you said, pushing a boundaries. I think the 624, 625 shows are both, really strong in that in that way amazing shows i feel like that second set of 625 it almost reminded me of the bomb factory tweezer fest in that sense of like flow and freedom that like it felt like it could go anywhere at any time and i when i heard that again i I remember listening to it but a long time ago i just couldn't believe it it is like a space reggae mcgrub like it is crazy it's like a reggae version with like space effects it's so cool and wild and i don't know why fishman sings cecilia because he doesn't know the words but it's still okay because then they an- end up in rock of william which is like the creepiest coolest thing ever that whole set is just perfect fish like absolutely perfect fish but i do want to highlight you mentioned it really briefly brian but from the 624 strasburg show the wolfman's is one of my favorite jams of this whole tour totally it's, if you were going to say like Megan, what is one of your favorite sounds that Fish plays? I would put that on and be like, it's this. It's just super textured, dark, monster funk. Fishman is just absolutely destroying throughout this whole song. It's so textured, but the beat under the jam, like I just want to live in it. It's like hungry and so connected. It's such a vibe. And then the peak is super driving. And at the end, Paige comes on and like, flirts with the piano for a few notes in the last minute and then it dissolves down like all good summer europe 97 jams do just melt away it's i've listened to this jam like five times and there's been a lot to listen to and i just keep going back to it it's it's so good and it kind of hints at that authority that they're going to bring to the u.s this summer like when they open up that 721 show it has a sense of like authority and that's what this jam does too it's like they know they're on top of this it's it's really great. What else you got, RJ? Um, well, my wife just came in while while you were talking, Megan. I just I want to give a shout out to uh, to this company that I really love. That's not even a sponsor yet, but they should be, which is called Go Brewing. I really love beer, as you guys know. But sometimes when I drink beer, like I want a beer that doesn't have alcohol in it, and I drink a lot of this stuff. You can only get it online, and it's like the only NA beer that I've had or one of the only ones that actually tastes like beer. And it's really great. And I really enjoy having one while I'm recording with you guys. So go brewing, like get in touch with us, you know, go yeah. brewing. Um, I, I guess the other, I mean, I guess we kind of have to talk about Amsterdam, but we got to, we have to, you, you we know, have to, it's, it's, I do think the 624, 625 are kind of, and I guess we're kind of talking about shows now, which is fine. Um, the six. I'm confused. Me, Are we talking about jams or shows? We well, I think decide. we're. Brian talked about a jam, <laughs> but when he talked about the jam, he mentioned six songs. So I think we're like both. <laughs> it's classic, Brian. Well, we're at the point where the jams. Yeah. This is a, a, a heated debate. Long. Jam this there, is a yeah. heated debate. Or is it just a song or are there segments? Right. I'm of the belief that there are sometimes segments and there are multiple segments, jams, set long even sometimes, as in the case yep. of 7-2, that it's impossible not to talk about multiple songs when you reference the jam. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> There's right, not a let's... controversy here or anything. 
<laughs> well, let's just talk about seven one because, and then we can talk about seven yeah. two because I think that's like really how you, what we have to do anyway. I don't know this. This show is like there's maybe one per year if you're lucky. Shows that are like a watershed moment. I think I think this show is it. I think seven one is it. I think from the beginning of Ghost, it's completely. It's just a completely different new sound, and and part of that is like the mix of the of the official release. It's it's incredible, but they come in with this like enthusiasm, and they're like there's a lot of yelling. There's a lot of like not just the back of the worm <laughs> stuff, but just like you can tell they're just like so excited, and yeah, like every song is stretched out. But just from that that ghost, which is, it's got like. It's got melodic grooves. It's got funk. It's got like, it it has everything, and it just is. It starts off this show that is just. It's really pretty incredible. But I think this is like the beginning of the greatness of of the year. I think that's a fair assessment. That like everything from six thirteen to six twenty nine is kind of this like. Does this work? And then they open with that ghost, yeah. and suddenly like. It works and pretty much every show from here to the end of the year is gonna have like real top tier moments. It, yeah, and that it, the whole that show, created, you know. Sorry, yeah, the I, whole I mean the the like limb by limb into Ain't Love Funny, like Ain't Love Funny, like we just have to have a moment to highlight this song. It it's so incredible. I don't know why it it died in 1997, but it is just such an unbelievable song and it's so amazing how they use it kind of almost use it like a what's the use here to like come out of like a big weird jam and settle in it's so eerie and vibey and I just love it but my favorite jam from this whole show is the gin into cities like this is also my stuff it's it's funky it's weird it's patient it's like eerie and careening it's so sexy I don't think fish has ever sounded as sexy as they do in the cities like it is so slow and dancey and just like I mean it's so funny like he can even check the lyric it's going so slow in cities that when he makes a mistake he has time in the beat to like fix the lyric that he messed up because it's so slow it's just like oh it's so good and this jam after after cities is just like it's that whole like looping, swirling, coasting along. And then they go into like the back of the worm stuff, but then they do like the saints go marching in. And it's one of these jams that I don't even mind when they do like a weird tease that feels very like, you know, there's even like a Santa Claus is coming to town tease. Like sometimes those teases like pull me out of like the drama of the jam. But for some reason with this one, it doesn't. It just, I think this jam is so well done and it builds and has this like emotional kind of energy and, and build up and end and gets more dancey. And it's just, I really love this section of music. This is the kind of thing that like, I'm always wanting to hear when I hear fish play. Yeah. I mean, there was a good couple of weeks where like the only shows I listened to were the seven, one and seven, two official releases when they came out. Cause I was just like, what, yeah. what else? Like why, <laughs> why would guys... I listen to anything else? Yeah. It's just, and everything is so good. And even like songs, like you, you mentioned the horn, like, a song like that that is it's one of my favorite three minute fish songs but it's usually played relatively the same on most occasions um someone's gonna call me out for live fish 15 so you're right there's a jam after that horn um but you know like even here there's like it's stretched out it has yeah. like an extended uh outro to it and so like you get even in standard songs a bit more weight and a bit more um, experimentation within them. I think the only um, critique I would make of all the Wormtown stuff is, you know, that Trey was a Dune nerd in like high school or college. And the fact that there's no Lisa Al Gaib being shouted out when he's like, I think you know where you are. <laughs> You're on the back of the worm. Like, come on, man. Like that would have been just like, perfect and yes. turned a whole new generation onto um onto dune but um no i, th I think opportunity. like jumping ahead <laughs> huge like come on trey what is wrong with you dude like you got 99 out of 100 and then you couldn't do that um i'm joking uh jumping ahead to the next night like you get the first <laughs> set a full set mike's groove that's amazing oh. and then you get in the second set apologies to everyone that thinks that a jam is one song I'm going to make a claim here. 
the stash into llama into wormtown into waiting is a full segment of music that's all connected thematically it's amazing ideas being poured from one area to another the fact that you get the stash i i I'm going to butcher this, so I do apologize in advance. Um, I believe that Scotty Bernstein says that the stash is his favorite fish jam of all time. Um, and I believe that the reason he says it is the middle riff that Trey finds and has no precedent for is not pre-written. Like this is one of the things when someone asked me, why have you seen this band almost a hundred times? It's because of moments like this where Trey plucks a riff out of thin air and builds a 10 minute long, gorgeous peaking song that sounds like it's pre-written and pre-rehearsed. And it just literally happened in the moment and has never been repeated again. And is the type of like addition to this stash that to something you said earlier, Meg, this tour and this year is not just all about funk. It's about how, where does the funk lead the band? Where does the communication and the connection lead the band? This is the furthest sound from funk that you could ever imagine. And yet it happens at one of the peak shows of the overall tour. That's what's crazy about this stash to me. It's 30 minutes long and it's, it doesn't once go to funk. And I think that that is just unbelievable restraint and just shows how creative they were at this point. I totally agree. This is songwriting in the moment. You know, this jam is effortless, and but still intentional. Such a narrative arc. It, it's just amazing to me that it has no funk and never goes there. I think it's just, wow. I listened to this again today and I just, it's one of those jams that just takes you to another place. It's totally transcendent. It's incredible. The fact that they open the set with this and then just have a whole set that's basically just a jam. And I don't, I'm worried about the people that were like in the room during this Wormtown jam. Like, I hope they were okay. Like that if you were in the room and on psychedelics, like that would be terrifying. I mean, which like, which is probably like most of the crowd. Yeah. And Tom Maybe not most, Marshall but... wrote, like I, I was talking about this on Twitter and Tom Marshall said that he's still not okay. So, you know, From people that, were yeah. changed. He's like, I was there and I'm still not okay. I mean, it's, it, it's like worm, the worm town jam or whatever, isn't even like a real thing. So you really have a three song second set, three song second set, which is, which crazy, is crazy. You're I opening mean, another can of worms. Are jams songs that should right. be noted at set list on fish.net. This is another podcast. Yeah. Right? And then we just have to also talk because we're talking about this and landing in the best song ever that came out in 97 like waiting in the velvet sea is just one of my favorite pieces of music lyrically it's unbelievable that fish has ever written and it's such a beautiful vibey landing spot after these jams like i just so good yeah i mean yeah there's a chance that if we any of us were there we would have had to like go outside during you know this set yeah and that would have been sad you know but in 97 that that could have happened might have had to <laughs> for, sh for sure for sure i had I, to take I some just, breaks in 97 i wasn't even <laughs> didn't even hear the Wormtown jam so for sure <laughs> i just want to say i think um i just want to comment on the uh the the night before i think the the bathtub gin in cities that's to me that's where like the idea of cow funk was like born during those mm. jams mm. it's a totally yeah. different kind of sound you start to hear it in like the 624 free and there's but but it evolves like at the beginning of the tour i mentioned this earlier it's sort of like they're just kind of playing with the wah pedal you know and then it just like evolves over the course of a few weeks to this like really different kind of sound that's really amazing and i don't i don't there's nothing else to say about the about the next night you guys already said everything so i don't know it, it's it's pretty wild well, what about the next night where they play a 30 minute version of ghost and it <laughs> takes like... elements of the stash, but it has funk, but it's beautiful, but it's haunting and weird. Like mm. if they just won't stop. And then you have the seven, five twist, the seven, six, you, you enjoy myself. Like it just keeps going. Um, yeah. I mean, the ideas are just pouring out. Like, I think we both are, we are all in agreement. Like the, peak of this tour probably happens around Amsterdam. Like that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's where everything is fully realized and everything from there is just kind of cake and like, cool. We're in Europe. We're about to go to the South of France and then we're going to America where we're going to play a full tour. And we've got this sound that we know, like we've harnessed and then we're going to play a festival. Like 
so it's all just like, you know, really enjoyable during that period in time, but man, they just keep going. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. One of my favorite moments on the tour too, is the seven, five sound check. It's they're playing funky bitch and you can hear Trey giving instructions on how to like funk, basically funkify it, like how to turn it into cow funk. He's like, if we like cut this in half and slowed down here in this part and you can hear them like do it and turn funky bitch into this like cow funk song. It's so cool to hear them like taking songs that they've played and turning them into this and putting them through this like effect. It's, it's really interesting. They should have kept doing that with funky bitch and I wouldn't, take bathroom breaks when it starts <laughs> i know everybody hates the song i like the, i like the song i'm a fan i also just think Fun. it's important as we all get older that there are bathroom breaks because you know we need them it's yeah true. you know it's very true mm-hmm. um so every show okay. needs a my soul <laughs> every show needs a my soul it's true what is um what's your big takeaway we've kind of talked in in about a lot of big takeaways i think um so far, but what, what's yours, Brian? Well, before we do that, can we make yeah. our live fish recommendation? Oh yeah, I always forget to do that. It's okay, yeah. I don't, because we've we've got the Amsterdam releases. Um, Meg, what would be your what? What do you think, Shapiro? Kev, you can come online, Kev, if you want to, um, and we can talk it out right here. Um, but yeah, Meg, what would chat. be your what would be your live fish recommendation from this tour? Six twenty five, Leo. Six twenty five, Leo. No doubt. Arch. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe 710. 710 is good. My two choices were 625 and 710. So we're all on the same page. I think I would tilt towards Leo because the segment of music that I, 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 we, we all talk, we all gushed about is like needs to be heard by more fans. I don't, yeah. I don't hear enough people tell me to listen to that. Like, and when I suggest I it to people, they're like, is this good? I was like, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> um, seven ten though. Like, is there, that's one of the most bizarre fish shows ever. We talked yeah. about that last year on our 40 for 40 series. It is just like, that is, you combine all elements of the fish summer Europe experience and put it in one show, the humor, the random songs getting jammed out without playing the first part of the songs, the random long extended jams. Even Julius is good. My God. Uh, take me to the <laughs> river. Um, Trey it's talking crazy. about how he's Danny Bonaducci. It's just, it's, it's, it's hilarious. It's clearly like that last night before, like to take your metaphor, Brian, like you're the exchange student. You're going home tomorrow. You're like, we're going all out tonight. Like we're just doing, we're partying tonight. We're smoking those unfiltered cigarettes. We're going to do all the things, you know, tonight. Cause yeah. we got to go home and put our, you know, regular clothes on, but here we get to be our European clothes one last time. Yeah. They don't serve Bruce Chappelle in the States and I'm going to drink all of it tonight. <laughs> exactly. And at least, at least Trey had kids at this point. So, you know, you're going home to like your little kids and, and regular life for a little while. Man, yeah. um, I will say just you, you know, we have no, we have besides Amsterdam, we have no live releases. We have nothing on live bait. We need we more. Have, we have, we need more. It's just, it's, I don't understand. I don't really get it, but you know, happy to discuss in more detail with anyone who's willing or able. Um, all right, Brian, now yeah. may I, may you, may you please present your takeaway? <clears throat> Um, so I have three, but the first one is a, uh, is a little game between the three of us. I'm going to ask you Whoa. a question. I'm going to name five artists. Okay. And to be clear, some of them may be folk artists. Just want to be clear, but we've got rock artists. They're not rock bands. stars. Oh. <laughs> not at all. I'm going to name five artists. And I want you to tell me what they have in common in conjunction with this tour. Radiohead. David Bowie, The Beatles, Fish, and Bob Dylan. I have something that comes off the top of my head. Go. There's Um, no wrong answer here, Meg. They have all changed and adapted their styles and grown as musicians or bands 
and been successful doing so. You get a gold star, whatever is equivalent of uh, a reward in third grade. An A+. In Mike's third grade, an A+. Plus. Reinvention is critical for all great artists. You cannot be a great artist and not look at your work and say, hmm, is there a different way to do this? If we turn this, I'm holding like a globe. If we like spin around <laughs> and like look at this from a different perspective, uh, like can we do this a different way? If Fish had not done this in 97, their legacy is totally different. Their whole experience is totally different. So reinvention is critical for all great artists. It's my first takeaway. I've got two. I thought more. it was that they all played at the Paradiso and played face melting shows at the Paradiso. Ooh, I gotta look sick, at RJ yeah. Man. Thank you. No, yours was a bunch more like, <laughs> you know, smart. Um, all right. What else, Brian? <laughs> your other takeaways you've got two more two more um all right so from here on out fish will be at their best as a forward-looking band trying to reshape their sound each year not only is this a reinvention of 97 and not only is this a reinvention from a sound standpoint um but this is a new approach to fish year by year by year they are going to present a new angle and it's something we are now used to as commonplace what will fish sound like in 2024 versus 2023? What are the new effects? What are the new, what's the new gear? How are the new songs going to impact them? What is the jamming from this year? Like compared to this year? And you can see it since the, from this point, uh, from this point forward, um, you definitely have some differences between like 95, 94, 93, but it doesn't feel as intentionally let's change right now. And let's see what's new. It's, it's fish bl uh, blooming. Um, <clears throat> and the last takeaway I have is that this tour, however, it represents, and this is a, 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 the difficult part of reinvention. Um, this tour represents a clear departure from who they were. When they reemerge in America in 11 days, they'll be doing so with a style that's unfamiliar and challenging to many fans. I have long heard that 97 was a line in the sand for a certain type of fish fan. Um, and I don't necessarily blame them for that. This is a very different sounding fish than what you heard a year earlier. And it represents stylistically, personally, a total departure from who this band was at, uh, was, you know, uh, in like the general cultural milieu. And, um, I can imagine for certain fans, there was a sense of like, that's just not for me anymore. Um, so it's, it's going to be reinvention and growth for the band, but it's also gonna be challenging from a fan base standpoint. Megan, what do you guys got? I think when I think about this tour and listening back to it, I really do come back to this idea that Fish realized at this point that finding a new direction can open up so many different places in their music. And it doesn't have to be they don't have to define their sound just by one thing. They can unlock that and use it as a way to find new spaces musically. And I think that it's also a time that they were working really uh, changing the, the dynamics or wrestling with the dynamics about the democracy of the band. And I think that that was going on beyond behind the scenes a lot, especially with songwriting. And I think about on stage was a place where they actually were able to be really democratic. And I think that that was why they wanted to like be there the most and live in that space the most. And I think that this is a time when writing music together and who was in charge and who got to make the decisions behind the scenes was starting to become stressful for the band. And I do feel like there's a lot of pressure starting to be on them. And a lot of those, you know, a lot of the things that would eventually kind of lead to their, to their, the first hiatus were definitely starting to be in place in this, in these years. But this is a time still when being on stage for them was really joyful and fun and exciting. And you can hear that in this music. You can hear them still being so young and joyful and having so much fun and creating together in a way that is truly revolutionary. And it's thrilling to listen to. And you can hear them being thrilled by it too. So the funk is a passageway, not a destination, and it leads to the flow. That's my major takeaway. Wow. Put that on a fucking t-shirt. I love yeah. that. <laughs> the funk got... is a passageway. Come on. My wow. God, I love that. <laughs> all right. Well, that's kind of all we had to say there. That's it. I can't 
I can't t- I can't top that, Meg. So I, I do love <laughs> and I really appreciate that you hint at the trouble that's lurking and that's going to come because that is a part of this as well. And as we talk, yeah. we'll talk about next week. Um mm-hmm. we're gonna start to hear what the other side of this reinvention leads to and what the benefits are, but also what the looming downside is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what are we doing point. next week? I forgot. Brian's pro- well, probably you're probably tell you listening. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you because that is, according to our notes, the closing segment, which I'm gonna take you on right now. Yay. So, Let's do it. <laughs> next week. Next week we have to get to work. Although we do have a little extra time. Okay, so we're gonna we're doing number tour number um twenty next week, mm-hmm. which is summer nineteen ninety nine. That is Ooh. We have 20 shows. Um, no, I mean, I guess I was going to say no festival, but I guess it depends how you look at it. Um, but 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 still, not really a festival. But a, a summer tour that's, you know, that's important to talk through and contains one of my favorite, one of my top five favorite jams of all time. So that, that's nice. Look at that. So, Same. Oh wow! I'm excited. I know we got a we got a lot to prep for. Um, so we are going to come. Uh, that's going to be Saturday, the twenty third. I think is when we're doing that. Is that right? RJ RJ requested for his birthday that uh, you bring at least five friends to HF Pod over <laughs> coffee uh, yeah. as we talk through some of Oh my god! It's, yeah, it's going to be a we ton have of fun. Two birthdays next week. Brian's birthdays next week, and RJ's birthdays next week. Lots to celebrate at HFI. It's true. It's true. And I will say, if you're still, if you're still like listening, which I guess many people still are, we're gonna <laughs> next next Friday on the twenty second. If you're in Philly, come to the Ardmore. I'm gonna interview Eggy before their show um, on stage, and it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be awesome. Amazing. And I'm, I, I definitely want input from people who have thoughts about questions I should be asking. So Brian, I will hit you up about that. But anyone else too. I just I just got uh, tickets for a bunch of my friends, and I am bringing a bunch of first time uh, Eggy fans. I don't know if they're Eggy fans yet, but they're 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 Eggy curious uh, <laughs> to the show. And they I've will been be. Them, been bombarding them with jam recommendations uh, for the Eggy show in Boulder in April. So I'm very very excited about that. So fun! I'll be seeing them on the 23rd at Brooklyn Bowl. I'll be seeing Eggy. And everybody should come. I might be wearing a costume too because it's for them. So apparently we have to dress up. So I might be planning something kind of fun. I can't wait to see the costumes. It's gonna be it's gonna be great. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys all for listening, and thanks for for showing up and hanging out with us here. And we will be back, yeah, in about a week. So thanks, and talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.